Thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Um, before I crack into it, uh, chaque fois je viens en France, uh, je sais parler français, uh, mais les Français parlent mieux anglais que moi. Uh, mais uh, la dernière fois uh, je suis venu en France, uh, quelqu'un a dit à moi, uh, hey, what about Brexit? <laughs> mais ce n'était pas quelqu'un, uh, c'était quelques deux, quelques trois, quelques trente, quelques quatorze. Please, uh, <laughs> ne parlez pas à moi à Brexit. Ce n'était pas mon idée. OK. That's, uh, ça suffit pour la France. Um, so, my talk is uh, using many worlds to solve the unsolvable, which I'll come back to shortly. Who am I? My name is James. Uh, I have worked for ThoughtWorks for four years. Before that, I worked for a startup for 10 years. Um, and uh, recently, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of my time at work researching quantum computers, which has been absolutely fantastic. That's one of the things that ThoughtWorks does. It encourages us to learn and, and grow new things. There's a bit of a timeline of ThoughtWorks. Um, you may have heard of us. Uh, we don't operate in France, actually, but um, uh, we, we, we have done work in France. And you may have read some of these books. Some of them are, these books were all written by people from ThoughtWorks. There's no books on quantum yet, but um, maybe there will be some time. <laughs> um, just a little bit, uh, we came to Paris yesterday. Um, as usual, I went running in Paris, but um, we're staying at so too far out, so I couldn't get a photo in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, we went into the Paris, it's a lovely city. I think, uh, and I thought that we might get a bit closer than that, but that was a nice looking picture anyway. And I noticed all the buildings are the same color, which is great. Um, I don't know if there are restrictions on architecture in Paris, or maybe people just respect it. Um, in London, they're all different colors and different eras, but they, there's a kind of uniformity, which I find quite pleasing. And because it's the Easter holidays, I came with my family, which I've never done before, and there they are. That's us with the Eiffel Tower, and again, we did actually get a bit closer, close enough, in fact, so that I could wear the tower as a hat, which I didn't quite realize at the time. Then we went on a river cruise. There's lots of bridges, I noticed, on the River Seine, many, many more than London, and, and very, very different styles. Um, possibly the biggest building in the world, I think that is, I think, I hope that is the um, Louvre. Could be wrong. <laughs> Maybe it's a different one. <laughs> then there's more bridges, and then just to prove there's other things in the river, there was a nice swan. And unfortunately, I was on the wrong side of the boat when we went past Notre Dame. Um, so I had to photograph it from down the river. But, you know, just to make sure we got another bridge in that picture there. Then we saw the Arc de Triomphe. And of course, we ate stuff to excess. That's my daughter, Felicity, who's cringing over there now. And there's an upside down fountain on the Champs Elysees. Who knew it squirts water downwards? I've never seen such a thing. It's rather wonderful. And then we over eight later. Normally, at these conferences, uh, there's a picture of beer or people staying up in 3 a.m. in my slides, but this didn't happen because of them, my, my wonderful wife and children. So, enough of that. What am I going to talk about? This, this is um, what we have. Um, why am I talking about quantum computing? What is quantum computing? Um, and then we're gonna, I'm going to talk about um, what it is, uh, this many worlds thing. So, uh, why quantum computing? Uh, just over a year ago, I was in a conference in Vienna, um, and I saw a talk on quantum computing. I didn't understand any of it. And I tried to approach the gentleman, uh, this is Alistair, this man, who's now a very good friend of mine, I asked him about it because I wanted to understand a bit more. And um, I, I found him as slightly difficult to talk to, could have been because I was a little bit drunk at the time. And I just thought, well, I'd like to do a better job of, uh, or a different job, trying to explain quantum computing to beginners. I assume most of the people in this room, has anybody programmed quantum computers in here? Nobody, okay. So that's the state I was in. And I thought, well, I think perhaps because this is usually the state of the audience, I can do, try and do a better job of explaining it to beginners. So I applied to speak at a conference. I put in my usual stuff about microservices, and I applied with this title. And this is about a year ago, and of course they rejected the boring stuff that everybody from ThoughtWorks talks about, and they accepted 
the thing that I knew absolutely nothing about, which of course made me feel a bit like that. So I then had to learn about quantum computing, um, and the first time I did this talk was basically a, a, a description of how I tried to learn the stuff and found it very difficult. I'm hoping it's a little bit better than that now. Um, and to the extent since then, has anybody heard of the ThoughtWorks tech radar? Uh, yeah, one or two, that's good. Um, so the latest version of the tech radar for the first time has this entry here, Q Sharp, which is a new entry. This was published back in November of last year. So the work that we've been doing at ThoughtWorks, we've got the awareness and we're now starting to say, have a look at Q Sharp for reasons that I'll come back to later. And uh, I did help to, to get that on there. So. What are quantum computers? So to understand quantum computers, it's first necessary to talk a little bit about classical, what we now call classical computers. Everybody else calls computers. Um, what do they do? Well, everybody I hope has heard of a bit. It's either a zero or a one. Classical computers manipulate bits. Typically, a bit is a, uh, a difference in voltage between two places. This thing here is a little picture of what's called a flip-flop circuit. You pass current in the top and it flips its value from zero to one. What do you do with those bits? Well, a classical computer has things called logic gates. These little pictures here are all logic gates. Going on in there, they're AND, OR, ZOR, things like that. I think most of us should understand that. And what the classical computer does is it gets thousands and thousands and thousands of these logic gates sums them all together to do something more complicated than just flip zeros and ones. And this picture here is 16-bit uh, floating-point arithmetic. That's the standard implementation of 16-bit floating-point arithmetic, just using zeros and ones or, um, uh, logic gates. And that is all classical computers do. So everything that we do as software developers is just aggregation upon aggregation uh, of these logic gates. So that's all they do. And none of us have to directly program those logic gates now because there's layers and layers of abstraction built on top that help us to do powerful and useful things. What is a classical computer? Sorry, what is a quantum computer? Well, a quantum computer has a thing called a qubit. So the qubit is a contraction of quantum bit. The qubit is its information storage thing. Again, like a, like a bit, if you read its value, you either get a zero or you get a one. So, so far, not much different. But that's far from the whole story, because before you read the value of a qubit, it takes any number of an almost infinite number of different values in between zero and one. And if you involve that qubit in a calculation, unless it's exactly zero or exactly one, both 0 and 1 will be used in your computation. And I'll come back to that later. And that is where the power of the quantum computers are. If anybody has studied quantum physics, you would have heard of Schrodinger's wave function. At any given point, a qubit, which could be an electron, it could be an ion, it could be a, um, a photon. Any tiny, tiny little quantum system can be used as a qubit. Uh, at any given point, its quantum state is expressed by the Schrodinger wave function, which I don't have time to go into, and frankly, I don't understand fully. When you read the value, the quantum wave function collapses to either a zero or one, which means from that point on, it no longer has all that extra quantum information, which is an interesting consequence. This is a picture of a single qubit. This is a, a logical representation of it. If you look at that picture there, the arrow marked by the Greek letter psi, which is that there, is representing the quantum state. You can think of it as a point on this sphere. So you can see that that's almost infinitely more possible values than a classical bit. As soon as you read the value, this thing here will collapse, and it will either be pointing straight upwards for 0 or straight downwards for 1. OK? Um, and this thing is called the block sphere. There's some links for you to learn more. Uh, the maths of explaining why the wave function collapses into a block sphere is far too advanced for me. So I'm not going to go into it. OK. What can you do with qubits? Well, like a classical computer, logic gates exist. And they're quantum logic gates. So there are very simple quantum logic gates, x, y, and z, which, if you look back on this picture here, 
they will perform a rotation of that quantum state through 180 degrees. So it'll either flip it around the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. This is the bit where I do some voguing, and I can always forget myself at that point. There are various other gates. The ID gate probably behaves as you'd expect it to. It does nothing. S and T do subtle things to do with uh, the wave function and how they move the, the phase, which, um, again, is very complex. The only one uh, that I'll really show you is, is this H gate, the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate is very fundamental to quantum computing. Again, if we look at this representation again, when you start your program, all your qubits will be in this zero state, exactly zero. The Hadamard gate will rotate through 90 degrees to the right, so the, this uh, psi value will be here, pointing horizontally, so halfway between the zero and the one. Now, what that means is if you then subsequently measure the value of that qubit, you'll either get a zero or one with about a 50% probability, but more importantly, if you use that qubit in a calculation within your quantum program, the quantum computer will evaluate both values simultaneously, zero and a one. That's where the power is going to come from. So I'm now going to show you a couple of simple ways to program quantum computers. This is a screenshot from IBM Q. Anybody heard of IBM Q? Everybody in this room said, OK. You can uh, open an account on IBM Q for free. Uh, and play with quantum computers. It, it offers two ways of programming quantum computers. I'm going to show you one. Um, uh, oh, no, that's my Strava account. We don't want that. Uh, oh, no, that's my business account. Oh, hang on a minute. Need to go quickly through here. Here we go. This is the one. Nothing like having a few uh, Chrome windows open, is there? Here's IBM Q. This is the IBM Q interface. Uh, I'm currently logged on. Uh, there are two publicly available quantum computers right now, IBM Tenerife and IBM Yorktown. You can use these for free. Both of them have only five qubits, so they're useful really only for training purposes. Uh, if you look up there, they're both currently active. They must have changed something recently. Up until a couple of months ago, every time you came to IBM Q, one was in maintenance perpetually, so they kept flipping between them. So they must have improved somehow the way they work. I'm not quite sure how. I haven't had a chance to talk to them recently. If I scroll down, we see this view here. This is called the Quantum Composer because it looks a bit like a musical score. If you look at the horizontal lines, you can see that uh, they're marked Q0, Q1. So each horizontal line represents one of the five qubits that are uh, in use within the computer. And what I can do is, as I said earlier, they all start off in that pointing straight up zero state. So I'm just going to, these things on the right are um, the gates. And it's a simple drag and drop interface. So I can drag an X gate onto there. And then this pink thing is a measurement, so I can measure qubit 0, and I can measure qubit 1. Then what I can do is I can either run the program there, but I'm not going to do that now because A, I'll be in a queue for ages waiting for it to execute, a bit like the 1960s, and B, it will take some of my credits because you actually get charged credits for doing that. But what I can also do is simulate, and there are lots of different quantum simulators. This is one. So I click this Simulate button, and I have to give it a name, which I never understood why. Clutters up the, the UI. There it goes. There's a simulation. What it's done is it's run my quantum program, I think, about a 1,000 times. I can't remember the exact number. And it's telling me that 100% of the time, the result we got was 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. OK? And that's because I flipped the value of this one here from 0 to 1. So all the others are still 0. So obviously, if I was to make this a little bit more complex, now if I simulate again, we'll get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1 as the result. Can everybody see that? Is that clear? Yeah. So now 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 100% of the time. Slightly more interestingly, if I now use a Hadamard gate, so this H on Q1, what that's going to do now is Q1 is going to be in that superposition state, halfway between the 0 and the 1. So about half the time it will return 0 when I read its value, and about half the time it will return 1. 
So if we simulate this, what we should see, as you can see, 52% of the time it was zero, the other 48% of the time it was one. Okay. So you can build much more complicated circuits with this. I'm not going to go into much more complex stuff than that. Although I will show it. For those of you that understand Python, I'm not a Python programmer, never have been. Uh, if I click up here, that's switched to Quasm. Uh, oh, didn't expect it to do that. There's this little editor window which is converting this uh, UI there into this Python dialect-y type stuff. So um, you can then write your programs, save them, submit them separately. So that, that gives you a little bit of uh, persistence of your programming. OK. Now I'm going to show you one more thing here. Has anybody heard of Schrodinger's cat? I think people have. <laughs> Thank you, Felicity. So Schrodinger's cat is um, a rather interesting thought experiment. Uh, the idea is you have a decaying isotope of something in a box with a cat. There's a 50% chance after an amount of time that the isotope decays. If it does, a Geiger counter moves. If the Geiger counter moves, it activates a hammer, which breaks a phial of poison, which kills the cat. What we've got here, and this demonstration I've seen in many, many different places, so um, it's far from original. What we've done is Q3 represents the radioactive isotope. We've put the Hadamard transform on that. So at this point, there's a 50% that it's zero. There's a 50% chance that it's one. But in other words, it's both zero and one. That was the purpose of Schrodinger's cat, but I don't want to get into that philosophical argument now. It is linked by this gate. This is the CNOT gate. Everybody knows what a NOT gate is, I hope, in, in standard computing. What the CNOT gate does is it, if the value of this qubit is 1, it will flip the value of this qubit. So the first one is called the control qubit. The second one is, is called something else. <laughs> so if we follow this circuit through, what we can see is happening is the Hadamard gate is the, the radioactive thing. This one here is the Geiger counter. This one here is the poison. And this one here is the cat. So what we should see from that circuit is if the first one is one, then they all want it cascades up. And there can only be that one result. They either all happen or none of them happen. And sadly, when we open the box, which is what is happening here, when we do the reading, we'll find out whether the cat was alive or dead. And according to this thing here, we should see about 50% of the time the cat remains alive. And about 50% of the time the cat dies. So if I do this, I should be able to open it into my... Oh, that didn't work, did it? Let's try that again. Schrodinger's cat simulation. I thought, right, open in Composer. That's better. don't know what happened the first time. Or maybe it was asking me to save that other one. OK, so if we simulate this, what happens? We should see, there you go, 51% of the time Unfortunately, the cat was dead. 49% of the time, the cat was alive. So far, so predictable. But what I'm now going to do is show you very quickly, and I can never find this because look at the way it gives me like loads of different versions. Ooh, when's that? January 2019. I think it's way back here. Right. So back in October of last year, I actually submitted this program to the real quantum computer to see how that would deal with it. And I think it's this top one. Let's see. <coughs> I know two of these were simulations and one was a real run. So let's have a look at Right, here we go. Now, this is when I ran it against the real quantum computer at IBM. What we can see is we got five zeros for 37% of the time. We got five ones. Oh, I need to. I think. Oh, that is five ones. We just lost one of the ones off the edge of the screen. About 29% of the time. So not, and what's all this stuff in the middle? Well, I'm afraid to say that what this stuff in the middle is is a, is a graphic illustration of why quantum computers are not yet ready to be used in production. These are errors caused to something called quantum decoherence. What we should see is a perfect correspondence of zeros or ones, but we don't see that yet. So there are physical limitations to the hardware that still exist that we haven't resolved yet. That's what that is. So uh, if you're interested, go ahead, set up, 
set up an account with, with IBM. Uh, it's free. You can play as much as you like. There are some great examples of some more complex circuits that you can do in there that, that, um, that I found very useful. So, this is the bit where I can't remember how computers work. Talk amongst yourselves. Right, so back to my presentation. I think if I press that button, it should kick off again. So, moving on. There you go. That was IBM. Comparing quantum computers to classical computers. So, I think we've already mentioned this. Because of the quantum state, while a quantum computer is uh, executing a program, it really holds exponentially more information than a classical computer. Those simulations that we run, uh, and I'll show you another simulation shortly, they very quickly run out of memory. Um, because the amount of information as you add more qubits, every time you add another qubit, you add another two dimensions in the vector space that is the whole um, universe of possible states. So it really expands really quickly. I think on my, I've crashed my computer running a simulation on about an 18 qubit system. So that's about as far as a five year old Mac will go. Um, they do. And this, this is key. There are problems that will never be solvable in classical computing, which I'll show you, which can be solved in quantum computers. Um, but on the downside, you cannot meaningfully persist state of your program. So remember what I said, as soon as you read the state, the wave function collapses. That means you can't save it. You, there's, there's no analog of putting stuff on a hard drive and coming back to them later. Because to read the state is to destroy it. So, that's a massive limitation. You can only do what you can do during the execution of the program. And, as I think I've just touched on, the hardware just isn't ready yet. There, are still, there is still a long way to go. There's something called quantum decoherence. It's effectively, a qubit leaks its state outwards and state leaks into it. This is why they have to be supercooled. We just haven't got that hardware right yet. It's getting better, but it's got a long way to go. And then finally, and I still maintain this, so some people dispute it to me, Quantum computers are hard to program. Right now, the only way we can program them is by manipulation of the gates and the qubits directly. Um, it's, uh, there are no great abstractions built on top yet, and we don't really understand how to build those abstractions yet. So moving on. Um, this is my daughter, Clementine, who's actually sitting down the front there. That is Clementine's cat. And my first uh, demonstration of quantum came about because I explained Schrodinger's cat to Clementine, and Clementine's reaction was, Daddy, why would anybody do that to their cat? And I had to explain, no, <laughs> he didn't actually do it to his cat, so I thought, oh, never mind. So we came up, oh, and that's my other daughter who's also here, but that's not part of the talk. We came up with this thing called Clementine's cat, and as you can see, she is doing the normal thing cats do. She's being indifferent to everybody around her. So we decided to run an experiment at home to see if we could get the cat to have a superposition of different moods. So what did we do? We, we did the experiment, and then it turns out that a cat can have a lot of different moods. <laughs> so I then thought, well, I will actually write a real simulation of cat behavior. So. Um, Wonderfully, Microsoft has given us something called Q-Sharp, which is a quantum programming language. Now, I'm going to show you very quickly the demonstration I wrote. Again, this is all free. You can go to Microsoft's website, download Q-Sharp, download. There's a great set of samples there that uh, get you off uh, programming in, um, uh, in quantum computers. Now, I'll explain the layout of this project quickly. So, there needs to be an interface between your quantum computer and the classical computer that controls it. At the moment, with real ones, it's by firing microwaves at qubits, which are suspended between ion traps or something. Wow, the hardware's like space age. But uh, in this case, you have a C-sharp program called driver.cs. And then below that, you'll see there's a Q-sharp program called operations.qs, which is the quantum code. So the idea is the C-sharp code executes against your uh, classical computer and then it submits stuff to the quantum computer. So just very quickly, here's the C-sharp program. You'll see here, what we do is we create an instance of the quantum simulator. This is the thing that I mentioned that crashes my computer if I try and make it run stuff with more than 20 qubits in it. Um, and then you essentially, later on down there, you see there's cat mood experiment run, and you pass it the simulator. So obviously the plan is, when there's a real quantum computer in the cloud that we can use, Instead of creating a simulator and executing it, you'll create an instance of 
Microsoft magic quantum cloud computing thing and pass that to your, uh, to your program. So I have two programs to show you very, very quickly. Just going to comment out the second one. So first of all, we have a, a program called Cat Mood Experiment. Now, there's basically, at the moment, there's two different ways to program quantum computers that are very common. One is you run the same experiment thousands of times and take the most likely result. This is the strategy that's being used by IBM to do weather forecasting. The other strategy, which is called, in some cases, quantum annealing, is it's a bit like an optimization type problem. You run the thing once with a set of parameters, you read the result, you tweak the parameters slightly, then you run it again. So you keep going backwards and forwards from your classical controller program into the quantum program. And last year, I was involved in a hack day uh, at ThoughtWorks in London where we were using the, we had exclusive use of the IBM computer and we were programming like that um, to discover some chemical properties. Anyway, this is a very simple program. I'll explain it very quickly. We've used uh, four qubits to represent the four humans in my family, who are all in this room, as I say. And what the cat does is, so we've applied a Hadamard transform to each of those four qubits. So we're in two states. We either feed the cat or we don't feed the cat. Or in fact, we're in both states at once, depending on how you interpret it. What our cat does is, she comes and asks me to feed her. Uh, and if I feed her, she's, uh, she eats the food. And then she immediately forgets I fed her. She then goes and asks my wife to feed her. If my wife feeds her, again, she eats the food and then immediately forgets she's been fed. Then she asks Clementine, then she asks Felicity. So the cat, being a cat, is happy if she gets fed at least twice. So what this program does is it essentially simulates that and then it counts how many times the cat got fed. And it runs it, I think, 100 times or 1,000 times. It tells us how many times the cat was sad and how many times the cat was happy. And then I'll just show you the program. This is all available on my GitHub, by the way. I think there's a link on the next slide. This is a very, very simple program. Uh, oh, I forgot to do .NET build, but we'll just have to wait for it to build. There it goes. So 80 times the cat was happy, 20 times the cat was sad. If we run it again, we should get a slightly different result. If you do the maths, it's the binomial theorem. I think it should be something like... Um, 11 fifteenths happy or something. I can't remember exactly. You can see there's a bit of a variation there. So the, um, the simulator is using random number generators to, um, to uh, simulate the quantum uncertainty. It has been postulated that uh, uh, quantum computers... What was wrong with that? Oh, it's clear, isn't it? Not dot .NET clear. Okay. Now I'm going to comment back in just to illustrate quickly the other technique of programming the quantum computer. Again, this is a very similar algorithm. The, the cat will just, there are four humans, they're in a Hadamard transform. Except this time we're going to run the program, get the result and output something, then run it again and output something. So we do it a hundred times. So what we should see in the output window this time is we'll see a, um, a succession of the cat being happy or the cat being sad, one after the other in the output window. Uh, so let's see what happens. And you can see sometimes the cat is happy and sometimes the cat is sad. Sorry, I didn't have time to translate it to French. I do apologize. OK, so as I say, go ahead, download Q Sharp, have a look at that. Every, all of this stuff is on my GitHub. Um, and I urge you to, to play with it if you want, because it's great fun. So, that's the last time I'm going to show some live code today. And we'll be pleased to hear. Moving on, so what are quantum computers good for? What's the state of the art? So, do you get Dilbert in France? Do people watch Dilbert? I don't know. Um, that's one from a couple of years ago. Um, I'll let that sink in. There is Microsoft uh, coming up for, a, well, just over a year ago, announced that they believe they will have working quantum computers as a cloud proposition within five years. I don't know if they regret that announcement yet, um, but we'll see. I guess we'll see within five years. Uh, there is a company in America called Regetti that have uh, a 72 qubit machine, I think it is, and they are, they've, for a publicity thing, announced this prize where 
if the first person or people that can come up with an algorithm that's provably quicker in quantum in real world conditions. Okay, cause we, we already know what algorithms will be quicker, but the hardware doesn't exist to run them yet. So they've announced this prize. So what do we need to actually have the cloud solution? Well, this is uh, kind of the stack that we'll need. These things are really hard, and they're the unsolved problems. We don't have physical qubits yet that persist long enough before they decohere. here. Um, it's hard to get your classical computer to talk to your quantum computer. Okay, as I say, because the classical computer is hot, the quantum computer needs to be cooled to uh, absolute zero virtually. Uh, and quantum error correction, there needs to be some system of understanding when they went wrong, which you can see from that IBM demo earlier just doesn't exist. You also need a cryogenic system. Uh, IBM is fond of telling people in presentations that their computers are colder than outer space. They believe it's the coldest thing that's ever existed in the universe. Don't know how they'd prove that, but there you go. So you need a cryogenic system. It's a solved problem, but it's very expensive, which probably means that we'll never have them in our living rooms. And then on top of that, you need an integration with a cloud provider. Well, that's going to happen, right? As soon as they've got a quantum computer, it'll take AWS about a second to make some cloud solution that we'll have. And you need your algorithms and applications. Well, that's already happening. I've shown you how to program stuff. And I know, I have, I know of consultants that are already doing this for banks, and I'll mention that slightly. So what's, why did I mention many worlds earlier? So again, I'm going to pause and show you a quick video. And I hope this is the exciting part, but who knows? This is certainly the bit where I can't remember how to run. And, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, oh, gosh. I need to go like that, I think. Arr. Why don't I just go oh, like that? That's it. That's the way. All right, here's a video. The three of us have been trying to reproduce the double slit experiment. So this is Ben, this is James, and I'm James as well. We've used equipment that you can find anywhere. Well, 3D printer, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Down here, we made a frame and a holder for our double slit. We made the double slit by using a sharp knife in between some tin foil. Here we have a laser pointer. It's the same laser pointer that I'm going to be using during the presentation. So who knows, I might even reproduce it if I've got this equipment, but it'll probably end up in the bin later. Down this end, we've got 3D models of Ben. We've got Big Ben and medium-sized Ben. Little Ben we left on the table over there somewhere. And they're holding our screen to receive the results. So let's see if we can make a diffraction, uh, an interference pattern at the other end of this desk. Very scientifically done this, and uh, there it is. Can we see the interference pattern? And that is quantum physics in action, as demonstrated for you in the ThoughtWorks office. Thank you very much. So on the left there is what well, this laser pointer looked like, yeah, yeah. just pointing. Really and that was all the outtakes. Believe me, that took us about an hour. <laughs> Amazing that. So what we've got there is that interference pattern. So what does that mean? Well. Helpfully, I do have some explanation of what that was all about. So that's Young's double slit experiment. You may have heard of it. You probably studied it at school if you did physics. Um, in 19, 18th, 19th century, 200 years ago, uh, Young thought that waves, uh, that light traveled as waves. So he wanted to prove it, and that was the way he proved it, by setting up an interference pattern, two slits, the waves either interfere positively and you get a double big wave or they are negatively, they cancel out, which is why you get that striped pattern. So everybody was happy. He says, yay, waves, uh, light is waves. And Newton was wrong. Newton thought it was something called porker, corpuscles. And then uh, what happened then? Well, after that, it turned out when people started actually studying it and uh, Einstein was one of the first that postulated this kind of stuff, it turns out, oh, hang on a minute, well, light doesn't travel in waves. It travels as a set of particles called photons. So um, even though it's loads of photons, which we know are particles, we still see this interference pattern. We don't see that. We don't see two solid lines. We see an interference pattern. So then everybody said at the start of the 20th century, oh, okay. So 
let's invent something called wave-particle duality. So sometimes it's a wave, sometimes it's a particle. And because there's literally millions and millions of them going through those slits at a time, well, they interfere with each other. Great, everybody's happy. Wave-particle duality. But, and that's the pattern you get, the interference pattern. Interestingly, after that, somebody in, uh, and I can't remember exactly when, in the 1930s, or no, a bit later than that, was able to set up an experiment where you still had the two slits and you can fire a single photon through. So now you're only firing a photon through, one photon. It's got nothing to interfere with. And yet, and yet, you still see this pattern building up over time. As each single photon goes through, it hits the screen and it sets up the interference pattern. What's it interfering with? So that was the big mystery in the middle of the 20th century. Now, Wheeler started to postulate that actually it's going through all the slits at once. It's following all the paths and it's interfering with itself. That's what the quantum computers are now doing, is using, that's the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. And this is what the power is built on. Now, David Deutsch, that you may have heard of, started to examine this and say, well, if this is really what's happening, I can invent an algorithm that would exploit the many worlds, exploit the interference pattern that qubits have with themselves. By putting them into superposition, I can make them interfere with themselves and get some useful results by examining the interference pattern that I see. Okay? There are two well-known algorithms. Deutsch Yosha, 1992, they devised an algorithm that is a quantum algorithm, which I don't have time to go into, and mainly because I didn't have time to write the code. But um, that proves that this interference is going on, as does Grover's algorithm from 1996. That's a search algorithm um, where you effectively, it's like opening every box till you find the right one. And logically, you think I have to open half the boxes. Well, by taking advantage of superposition and the interference patterns, Grover's algorithm can examine all the boxes, then examine them all again, and do it only square root of n times to get a good result. How does it do that? Well, there's one very important thing. This is a third way that it's exploited. If anybody's done digital signal processing, you've probably heard of the Fourier transform. The quantum Fourier transform exploits the interference pattern between all the qubits in your program and allows you to examine it to get some useful results. I don't have time to explain that fully. We are using those to model traffic flow at the moment. A company called D-Wave is modeling traffic flow using this technique, using the many worlds interference patterns. IBM, as I mentioned, is, is using these interference patterns to in make inferences about weather forecasts. And in the UK, there are several companies using these type of interference patterns to execute all the scenarios simultaneously to understand what's going to happen in financial markets. It's a bit theoretical at the moment, but I know they're using quantum computers to test these algorithms, to have them ready for when the real quantum computers will be around. So a lot of the big banks are getting interested. And the most interesting part to me is quantum chemistry. This is the caffeine molecule, which we understand. This is iron molybdenum, which we don't. Iron molybdenum lives in bean plants, which fix atmospheric nitrogen. We currently use 5% of the world's natural gas on the Harbour-Bosch process to make fertilizer. Beans do that with no energy. So if we understand that iron molybdenum complex, we can potentially do away with this massive process. That's the big promise of quantum computers right now. And that uses these interference patterns that exist between all the qubits that you can't see, really, and exploits them in ways that are really clever. So, the last thing I'm going to go through is the elephant in the quantum room. So, anybody know who these people are? I'm going to guess not. There's their names. Anybody know who these two are? When I show you the names, you would have heard of them, I'm sure. They're Diffie and Hellman. So, they're big in quantum... Uh, sorry, they're not big in quantum, they're cryptographers. Anybody want to make a guess at these? Yes, they're RSA, well done. They are Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. Come back to those. So, how does encryption work? It works by multiplying two numbers together, which is easy, and relies on the fact that it's hard to factorize those two numbers. Until quantum computers. So, there is something called Shor's algorithm, which has been around since the 1990s. This is a quantum algorithm that factorizes numbers 
in polynomial time. So the best known uh, classical algorithm will take longer than the lifetime of the universe on the biggest theoretical computer, one that uses every electron as a bit. It will take longer than the lifetime of the universe to factorize a 3,000-bit number. So that's unbreakable. Shaw's algorithm is polynomial time. It works a bit like this. I'm not going to run through all the algebra. But it relies on the fact that, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you an example. If I want to factorize 15, I don't check all the prime numbers less than 15, although in this case that would work quite quickly. What I do is I choose a random number, in this case 4. I find the period. So 4 squared is 16, which is 1 mod 15. So it goes 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, if you keep raising it to a successive power. So its period is 2. So if I do 4 to the power 1, which is half of 2, minus 1 is 3. Hey, presto, that's one of the factors of 15. And 4 to the power 1 plus 1 is 5. That's the other factor. That's a trivial example. So 15 is 3 times 5. Here's a slightly more complex example that I worked myself through. And you can see these numbers. This was to factorize 1,517. And by running through the algorithm, we find that 37 and 41 are the factors. Just to illustrate a little bit about how complex all those calculations are, I did this in a spreadsheet. And this is only 1,517, right? It's not the world's biggest number by any means. And I worked through it to try and find the factors like this. Finding the period of these numbers and then applying Shaw's algorithm. You see, the period of this number happened to be 60, and so on. But then I, what I needed was a number where its half period, in this case 30, didn't overflow. You can see it's overflowed. So it took me ages to find one. In the end, I found that 14 had a period of 24, which means that 14 to the power 12 minus 1 and 14 to the power 12 plus 1 reveal the factors. So why am I showing you all that? Well, it's because of the fact that we don't care about all those big numbers in the spreadsheet. All we care about is the repetition, the period. And by using, uh, oh, we just went through this slide. By using the quantum Fourier transform, which exploits the many worlds and the interference between all those numbers in that spreadsheet, we can work out that the number we want is 12. We don't care about all the intermediate results. That's what flips it from being an exponential complexity algorithm to being an algorithm of complexity, um, polynomial complexity, which means it's solvable. If you go to my GitHub, there's an implementation uh, of uh, Shaw's algorithm, which I don't have time to go through, but it's pretty cool. What is actually cooler is my colleague Andrew did a better implementation when I asked him, so if you, uh, if you want to make my code look crap, look at, uh, look at his GitHub, because his is much better. Um, but it still took his computer one and a half hours to factorize 35. But we were both celebrating when he told me this. So is RSA dead? Well, at the minute, you need a computer that doesn't exist to exploit it. It's still a few years off, um, as we've said there. And there are, sorry, back one. There are ways around it. There are algorithms that we can implement that will not be vulnerable to this attack. Why am I saying all this? Well, uh, here we are. There are vulnerable. Bennett and Brassard 84, that's, that's a quantum algorithm, that's a quantum system that is unbreakable. And there are some algorithms that are also will be safe. Why am I bothering to tell you that? So let's go back to these people here. 1976 was when Diffie and Hellman published their paper, the first public key exchange description, right? 1977, RSA was published. That's when encryption started, right? That's when public key cryptography started. Well, no. In 1997, it emerged that those three gentlemen on the right already had these algorithms many years earlier. The British government never told anybody. I guarantee you right now that all of the world's secret services are gathering all of your RSA traffic right now and holding it. Because whilst they may not be able to break it now, they will be able to break it in a few years' time. Do you, are you happy for that to happen? If not, you need to start looking at post-quantum cryptography right now. 
And I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. I think I ran out of time for questions. Am I allowed to take questions? Yeah, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Um, maybe one? There's, there's one there. Um, it's, it's, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and um, I have the impression, or it seems, that you, you are um, a proponent or you defend the, the uh, many words interpretation of yeah. quantum mechanics. But, uh, but it seems that it's uh, a little bit, uh, this interpretation is a, is a little bit sterile because we, we can't test that um, anyone in his uh, own world can yeah. test, that can, can't see the other words by definition. Yeah. And uh, second, uh, there is an infinity of uh, words. Th so we can we can do anything with it. So this infinity plus it's not testable. It's not uh, testable by the experience. Seems that it's not um, the, okay. the, the the best uh, the best uh, interpretation against the orthodox one, which is the um, Copenhagen. Um, so there is a controversy between the many worlds interpretation and the Copenhagen interpretation. Well, the reason one of the reasons I mentioned David Deutsch is that David Deutsch believes that the deutsch joscher algorithm and the quantum Fourier transform and the um, Shor's algorithm together prove many worlds because there is no better explanation. The problem how, is... How does we it prove? How, excuse me, how does it Copenhagen prove? doesn't explain Shor. That's what a lot of the scientists are now saying. Uh, many worlds so does explain Shor, but, but that's the, I agree that is not a proof. We can only say that there is evidence of it, but until somebody comes up with a better explanation... It's the best explanation to explain the interference pattern. Copenhagen interpretation does not explain the single photon experiment, the single photon double slit experiment. Copenhagen and wave particle duality does not explain that. So that, that's an open question still, but I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's still controversial. Uh, I'm not a physicist, and the people that are physicists can't agree whether which, which is, which is there prime. There are interpretations. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I happen to have read a lot of David Deutsch books. And he's a big proponent of many worlds. I should balance the ledger and read some books by uh, other people, but I haven't had time to do it yet. But I, I agree. I, th I think you're right to call it out. It's controversial. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks for everybody for coming. It was fun. Thank you very much.